Let's start our discussion of Rawls with a basic overview of who he was, because Rawls was the man. So this is a very recent philosopher. He died not too long ago, right? He died in my lifetime, right? Just before you were born, right? But he set the stage for ideas about rights and fairness in societies today. So if you're in a discussion, let's say you're on a hospital board, you're on a governing board, or even just you're a dean of a school, the leader of some kind of company, even a small company, if you are in a dispute and you say that Rawls' position supports my view, it is very hard for anyone to defeat you. He has created such a clear and hard to argue against conception of fairness that if you can show that your policy or position is Rawlsian or follows Rawlsian fairness, then the other person is automatically on the defensive. There are whole books written about how can you find a, a chink in the armor of Rawls' view. So this is the status quo when it comes to justice, rights, and fairness. We can also ask if we live up to this, and no, we don't, but this is the thing that we realize that we're on the wrong side of history if we can't live up to what Rawls is saying about a basically fair society. All right, so what is the basic goal? Oh, sorry, let me say one more thing about this. Please know that this reading, I hope you've seen it, you're supposed to read it first, is only a page. This is a monstrous book, right? Like a 500 page book that I used to give students like three or four pages of. And they said, oh my gosh, Jeff, I know it's short, but this is incredibly hard. So I turned it down to two pages and people still said, that is one of the hardest readings of the semester. So now you're at a page. So you're welcome. I am sorry. He is really smart, but he writes in a very dry, but very long winded way. He's a very, very careful thinker, but, right, it's a task to read his work. All right, so the goal is right here in line one. Let me try to unpack line one so we can see what the point of all of this is, right? So line one of the one-page reading of Rawls. The guiding idea is that the principles of justice for the basic structure of society are the object of the original agreement. All right, so here is where you will hear Rawls' view talked about as the original position or the original agreement. So that's the test you use. Now notice this idea. When he says these are the principles of justice for the basic structure of society, please start thinking of society in any sort of a frame of reference as you want. Think of society as a family, think of society as our class, or of course this could be a whole nation or a whole United Nations. And so the idea of society here could be written big or small. The other key is these are the basic principles. Let's talk about what that is. If you're at CNN, right, you sign a little statement when you enter CNN saying things like, you won't cheat, te sorry, saying you won't cheat. CNN says we promise not to discriminate. So these would be the basic principles of your education here at the school. Now think of the basic principles of a country. So what is Rawls talking about? The Bill of Rights for us. The Bill of Rights sets out in our Constitution the basic principles that our society must, must live up to or citizens can have an objection to their government. Think of this. Can you explain to a child what the Supreme Court does? You know what the Supreme Court does? Is technically what Rawls is talking about. The Supreme Court's job is to make sure a law doesn't defy or go against the basic principles of our society. Again, where do you find those? The basic rights in the Constitution. So the Supreme Court's job is to make sure that our laws are fair based on our basic principles of fairness, which are in our Constitution. And it's pretty great. In fact, a lot, some of Rawls, eh, maybe most, are in our basic Bill of Rights, right? But do we live up to them? Rawls is going to help us live up to them better. All right. So now, here is the big line. Here is where he has a brilliant conception of fairness. But what I'm hoping is, as you're understanding this, that you'll see, okay, here's a problem. Because the only way I know that you understand Rawls is that you start thinking like it, right? Not just that you can tell me that doesn't fit the definition, but you can understand its motivations. So I would love it if you could think, maybe even pause, 
when you think of a possible problem because when you see the possible problems, then the solutions will really make sense and you'll start to think this way. Not just see it as a set of little rules written down, but see it as a mindset of how to think about society. And then you are going to love this. Because remember, I think what this amounts to is something that you agree with and you'll like it a lot. Remember again in the uh, political spectrum video, please go and look at the end of that to frame this whole discussion. This amounts to an egalitarian view, a concern of fairness, a concern for things like equal opportunity. At the very end, some people look at this and they misread it and they say, oh, this sounds like socialism or communism. Do we all have to be equal? No, that's not the idea. Remember, in an egalitarian society, if there are inequalities, they are okay as long as they were obtained fairly. What does fairly mean? You applied innate skill, you developed skill, and you worked hard. If you have more of some resource than someone else and it was based on those reasons, that's a fair inequality. All right, so let's go back. So here in line two through what four is the whole idea and you are looking for the problem. All right, so here's the idea. They are, right? So these ideas that we're going to come up with that are going to make sure society's fair. They are the principles that free and rational persons concerned to further their own best interest would accept in an initial position of equality as defining the fundamental terms of their association. Okay, so pause. So he is saying the goal here is to come up with principles that are fair. And how do we know they're fair? Because if we imagine people in a situation where they are free, rational, equal, and concerned only with their own best interests, these are the basic principles they would agree on. All right, so right there. That's a really way to conceive of fairness. All you have to say is the best way to see if this rule is fair is to allow everyone to see if they would agree with, with it as long as everyone met the four conditions. They were free, rational, equal, and concerned with their own best interest. Does anybody see the problem? I hope you see it. The problem is we're not in that kind of a situation. I mean, yes, Rawls, that's a great way to define fairness, but how often are we free when we're making these sorts of decisions? No, right? Put the idea of being free together with the idea of being equal. Think of a society or even a situation where people are both completely free and equal in their making decisions and right, protesting to decisions that are being made. Take our classroom, for example. If we were coming up with the basic rules of our classroom, are we free and equal in making these decisions? No. I am so sorry, but if we wanted to be free and equal, the first thing we'd have to do is get rid of Jeff. Because what? Jeff has a little more say in these things, right? It's a fairly unequal situation we're in. I am so sorry, right? But that's one thing you would do. Now, you would probably have to get rid of some other members too because they say too much. They have too strong of an opinion. Other people are more shy. So we don't have this kind of free and equal situation very often. What about, and now we get deep, what about rational? Are people rational when they're making decisions like this? No. I think our discussions of, say, Freud, Marx, Fromm would have let you see that people aren't very rational. They often rationalize. They can't tell you why they do the things they do because they lie to themselves about it and then they make up reasons after the fact. Lastly, self-interest. We would think at least people are good at this. No. Look at the Milgram experiment. You could see what the people wanted to do. Did they do it? No. They suffered because they thought that was for the best. They sacrificed what they wanted to do for something that they thought was the society's best interest, which in that case was obedience. Now go to another side of self-interest. Think back to Marcuse and Fromm. Do people really seek their true needs? Are they really self-interested? No. They give up on them. They buy artificial needs. They accept alienated work. And these are not in their own best interest. Think of the Smith story, right? Think of Adam Smith. What does a young man do? Ruins his chance of happiness to get a, to try to follow an image of luxury that he thinks will bring him happiness. No, we suck at self-interest. All right, so I hope you predicted that. But here is the solution. 
Okay, so here we go. So, again. Uh, let's go to the first indent of the second paragraph. Good. Thus we are to imagine that those who engage in social cooperation choose together in one joint act the principles which are to assign basic rights and duties and to determine the division of social benefits. Alright, so we're coming up with basic social benefits and do notice that this will be an imagined situation. Now, that hasn't fixed it. Just because we're saying this isn't an actual position where people agree or disagree, it is hypothetical, it is imagined, but still. We have to imagine a situation where we fit those four traits. And it's hard to do. Then he has his magical solution. I mean, this is really interesting. So now we are in the third line of the third paragraph of the Rawls single page reading. Among the essential features of this situation is that no one knows his place in society his class position or social status, nor does anyone know his fortune and the distribution of natural assets and abilities, his intelligence, strength, and the like. I shall even assume that the parties do not know their conception of the good or their special psychological propensities. The principles of justice are chosen behind a veil of ignorance. This ensures that no one is advantaged or disadvantaged in the choice of principles by the outcome of natural chance or the contingency, the contingency of social circumstances. Since all are similarly situated and no one is able to design principles to favor his particular condition, the principles of justice are the result of a fair agreement or bargain. All right, a lot of words. So first notice what this idea is saying. Now, we get why he's putting a veil over us, right? And the idea is, here's the basic principle. You have to imagine that when you're deciding the principles of your society, you have to imagine that you don't know who you are. Now, pause there. Let me show you why it has come up with, and then let's talk about some of the problems psychologically with doing it. So first, we can see why he's doing it. If you don't know who you are, if you don't know your particular interests, let's go through the list. If you don't know your gender, you don't know your abilities or disabilities, you don't know your social class, you don't know your conceptions of what a good life is. Well, if you don't know those things, then, now notice how hard that'll be to imagine, but if you don't know the particulars of you, notice, when you're thinking of that society, you're not going to cater to your own interests. If you know that you're wealthy, and this is how laws in our society work, then you're going to cater your interest to people who have money. You're going to cater your interest to your particular position. And if you can pay off right, your representatives to give you what you want, cough, cough, you're going to get what you want. You're going to have a society that caters to the wealthy class. Now, he is saying, you have to imagine you don't know who you are. But... I think we need to separate another way to do this. So, right, let's make it clear. The first idea that is when you're deciding, when you are imagining, you are deciding on the principles of your society, the first way to think of this directly from Rawls is you have to imagine you don't know who you are. So when you're deciding these principles, you have to imagine I can't cater to my interests because I don't know what my interests are. I don't know who this is that is deciding what's fair or unfair. And so now notice, you're going to be a little more fair. But I think there's another way to think about this that I hope Rawls would approve. Again, he's dead, right? But I do think this fits well. And it's easier for us to do psychologically. Because I think it's hard to imagine you're nobody. It's hard to imagine you have no interest. How do I go at something with no interest at all except fairness? That's really weird. So my idea is that you take the basic idea he said, where instead of pretending you don't know who you are, I think it's easier psychologically to pretend you could be somebody else, anyone else. Pretend you could be any of the people that could be affected by these principles. So pretend if you're thinking of a classroom. Pretend you are people that are nerdy and love to learn. Then pretend you are people that are trying hard to want to learn, but you don't have the best study skills. And then pretend, and then just keep pretending you're anyone. If you are deciding the principles for a school, right? The basic rules for a school. You have to pretend I could be the principal. You have to pretend I could be a teacher. I could be a student. I could be someone that lives in the neighborhood of that school. I could be a counselor at that school. I could be a student that's excelling. I could be a student that's having family problems. I have to imagine I could be anyone that is affected by these principles. 
But I think that's easier to do. Now we come to a key test of whether you're getting this. Because what he's going to do next is, is he's going to say, here are the two basic principles of justice. Meaning, here are the two basic principles any society must abide by if it's going to be fair. But the way you know you understand this is if you understand that these are the principles, not that Rawls is telling you should adopt, you should adopt. He is not saying, here are two principles I'm recommending to you. He is saying, in fact, that these are the principles you would come up with yourself. If we set up a situation that's fair, how do we set up a situation that, that is fair? By imagining we don't know who we are, or in my other scenario, imagining you could be anyone. That makes sure we don't discriminate based on our own interests, but notice what he's saying. He is saying these are the two principles that you would come up with yourself if you were under the veil of ignorance. If you don't know who you are, you would come up with these two principles on your own. I think that's brilliant. He is not saying, I am this genius Harvard professor, right? He was. He is saying, here's what you'd come up with too. As soon as you put yourself in this position and you do it thoughtfully, you would come up with these principles. So here they are. Here are the principles we come up with. And you would, you'd really think about this, would you? In the veil of ignorance, not knowing who you are, imagining you could be anyone, would you come up with these? I think you would. Here we go. The persons in the initial situation would choose two principles. The first requires equality in the assignment of basic rights and duties. Basic. Now that's one that we technically have in our constitution, right? Equal rights. The second holds that social and economic inequalities, for example, inequalities of wealth and authority, are just, are fair, only if they result in compensating benefits for everyone, in particular for the least advantaged members of society. All right, so let's write those down, please. Now notice a key idea, just for a clarification. He had to add that last line in the second principle, because, sorry, but during the Reagan days, during the 1980s, that really paved the way for our society all the time since then, and we're still dealing with this now, with the radical inequality, the Reagan notion of equality was, we need to cater to the majority. Now, that even was hard to say, because it was kind of the wealthier class that did well. But they didn't have this conception that we are going to be fair to everyone. They were worried about the majority. And this meant they could pass laws that really screwed over the poor class and the working class. And then what they said, and notice this will sound like Adam Smith if you were paying attention, that if we cater to the wealthier class, those advantages will trickle down. And then they said this, sorry for the tangent. They said, well, yes, the working class, the poor will be disadvantaged for a little while, but they'll come back. Right? When the economy booms and the upper levels, this will bring up, this will rise all the boats, using the metaphor they liked, of everyone. No, it didn't. The poor class and the working class were so far behind that it, it still, they are still haven't caught up since. Social mobility is not back to what it was before these days. Anyway, so come back to it. So what Rawls had to do is say, no, when I'm saying they benefit everyone, I mean everyone. I don't mean just the majority. I don't mean just the wealthy. I don't even mean just the middle class. He means everyone. All right. So you should look at those two principles. And if you, if you are making me really proud, you are seeing a problem with the second one. But let's go one at a time. Under the veil of ignorance, you don't know who you are, or you could be anyone, not yourself, but anybody in the society. Would you agree that all rights and duties must be fair? Do you agree that what people are allowed to do and what society asks of them must all be free and shared? Well, of course you would, but why? The motivation, the attitude is the key. You, you shouldn't say, this is not how you should think of Rawls. You shouldn't think of it as, well, yeah, that would be fair. No. Under the veil of ignorance, you're imagining, right, that you don't know who you are, but you are trying to further your own interests. Remember, under the veil, you can see why you would then be free, rational, and equal. Because you don't know who you are. You could be anyone. So, of course, you're going to want things to be free, rational, and equal. You're going to have that standpoint. Because 
you're worried about everyone. Not because you're worried about everyone, but because that could be you. You're worried about every single person benefiting because you don't want to be screwed over. So why would you vote for equal rights and duties for everyone? Because I don't want to be that one person that's left out. I don't want to have rights for everyone except women because I don't know who I am. I could be a woman. I don't want to have rights and duties equal for everyone except for the disabled, except for the Jew in Nazi Germany. You would say, no, if I don't know who I am, I could be a Jew. Now notice the second part, because that's where the, some people would see a problem. First, they would say, well, if everyone has to benefit, doesn't that mean that everyone has to be absolutely equal? No, this isn't a socialism or a communism. Remember, it's an egalitarianism. It says there can be inequalities as long as they are obtained fairly. All right. The other problem I hope you see, if you're a really big nerd thinking a lot about this, is, Jeff, we might not need the second principle at all. Wouldn't the veil of ignorance make force us to have a completely fair society that doesn't disadvantage anyone? And so we won't really have situations where there will be inequalities of wealth that are very great. Now again, this is egalitarianism, so there can be inequalities as long as they start fairly and start from equal opportunities. But notice, I do think when we apply this, you will see that there are places where we need principle two, where we will allow for inequalities even in the basic principles. Now notice, to say it's egalitarian means the outcomes might be different, but the principles have to be fair. But I think there are places where we would vote for some inequalities in our principles, some principles that allow for inequalities in the way people are treated. But it's completely the reverse of everything you are thinking now. All right, so let's try to apply this. And when we start to apply this, I think some of you are going to have a light bulb moment. I think some of you are going to go, oh my gosh, this is great, right? Now I get it. All right, so remember, as we look at these different examples of how to apply it, I want you to think not, right, I would agree to that because it's fair, but I would agree to that if I'm under the veil. If I don't know who I am, if I could be anyone, I would agree to that. Why? Because it's best for me. Now notice, but it's not a selfishness of saying that would be best for me because you don't know who you are. So you're thinking in self-interest. But because you don't know who you are, it's a fair conception because you're thinking of everyone. All right, so let's try. So let's say, right, using principles one and two, but more importantly, just thinking of the veil, but they should come up with the same answer. What would you do if about, say, health care? Let's look. Would you vote for basic preventive health care for every citizen in your society? whether that's your nation, your state, or whatever, would you, under the veil of ignorance, vote for basic preventive health care? Now, first, you would say, uh, yeah, that's fair to everyone. But again, that's the wrong conception. Would you, if you don't know who you are, or you could be anyone, vote for this? Of course you would, because it benefits absolutely everyone, and it is the only fair and free way. Now, by the way, is this an affordable way to provide health care? Absolutely it is. It pays for itself. If you prevent a lot of illnesses, they are a lot cheaper to treat. We do it just the opposite, as you obviously know. What would you say? Why would you vote for this? Well, according to the two principles you would, it gives people free, e free and equal rights and duties. And of course, it benefits everyone. So it fits the two principles. But notice, I think you would vote for it just thinking of the veil itself. If I don't know who I am, yes, I need basic preventive health care. All right, let's try another one. Now, this one's more radical. What would you do under the veil or based on the two principles if there was a failing school in your area, right? You find out that a school in the Rio Grande Valley is doing really poorly. Well, according to the, the veil, according to the original agreement, the two principles, would you allow that to continue? No. But why? Again, that wouldn't be fair. No. Put yourself under the veil. Would you do something about it? 
Of course you would, because you might go to that school. You might be a teacher in that school. You might be an employer who recruits people from that school. You might be a policeman who polices that area. You might be a family. You might be a teacher, right, in that school. And if you imagine yourself in that position, you would say, this has to be fixed. Why? Because it would be better for me. But notice, you're not being selfish because you could be anyone, and so you're thinking fairly. And so you would say, if my kid goes to that school, no, that's unfair. Exactly. Now you're getting it. Does this fit the two principles? Sure, right? It's a fair society, and it benefits everyone. Now notice, you might think of that. You might say, well, if I am cheating at this rule, what if I only imagine that I'm a rich person? Well, you're being stupid. You're not being fair. But think about this. Would this benefit everyone? Yes. A fairer society where everyone has the same opportunities in education benefits everyone. It creates a more merit-based society. Does it also reduce things like crime if you have more opportunities? Yes, it does. Any study of sociology will reveal that. So this would benefit everyone, but most especially, it would benefit you if you don't know who you are. You are going to play it safe and say, I don't want to roll the dice and hope I'm not in that school. No, I want a society where, no matter who I am, the benefits accrue to me. And that's the second principle. Now let's try a more radical application of the second principle and see why we need it. Try this one. Would you ever vote? So now notice, this is already going to rule out vast inequalities in healthcare and education, which is a big problem in our society, as you see, right? Who has access to tests during the coronavirus? Depends where you are and who you are. Damn. All right. So try this one. Would you ever vote for unequal health care? Now, please know. I do not mean it in the way our society does it, where rich people get more health care. No. Would anybody get extra health care more than other people? I am going to pause here, even though I am so hyper, and I want you to think about that for a second. Would we vote under the veil of ignorance that some people get better health care? Would we vote on extra health care for some people, and this would be fair to everyone, and second principle, benefit everyone. Can we find a place where we would vote for a genuinely unequal distribution? Did you get it? Right? Some of you are guessing things. Some of you are guessing, well, yes, let's see, extra health care for important people. Okay, maybe, right? But that would be really hard to define. I think there'd be a lot of disagreements about who the important people are. Let me go the other way. And if any of you did this, I am so proud of you. Why wouldn't we simply give extra health care to sick people? It's so brilliant. And it is such a cheaper and more efficient way to give health care. Notice, who gets extra health care? Whoever is sick. If you have cancer, right, you have a virus, right, you have an infection, you have an injury, right there you get extra health care. Everyone else gets basic preventive health care, and so would they object? Would they say, hey, right, that's not fair. That sick person gets more health care than I do. What would we say? No, you moron. You don't need anything but preventive health care because you're healthy. And you can't object that this is unfair because if you get sick and need health care, you get extra. By the way, is this how our society does it? No, just the opposite. Let's say it in a weird way. Who has the most health care in this society? Healthy people do, right? Healthy people who are rich with good health insurance, right? They get quick treatment, they are healthier, and they have a ton of health care. They're hoarding the best health care. I have pretty good health care, and I'm basically healthy, right? Why do I have good health care? Not because I'm sick, but because of my middle class position in society. It shouldn't work that way. Notice. All right, so. I hope that was a light bulb moment. I hope you were looking at that and saying, why don't we do health care like that? That would be way more affordable. People that don't need health care, they would pay into it just in their little fair share. And then we would be pooling together our resources. And then we can afford it when one person needs extra. By the way, 
That's how healthcare works in every society, every rich democracy except ours. You pull your resources together so that you can afford an expensive treatment for someone because you don't need it right then. You pay your little bit in. It's like roads. We all pay a little bit for roads and then they're super cheap and we can all use them. Anyway, let's try another one. Would you ever vote for extra education? That some people get more education than others. Now I think you're starting to see it. For the most part, no. Notice we looked at an example earlier. If there is unequal education in the most basic sense, you would say, no, we have to stop that. That's an unfair society. That could be me. Now, I think we would vote that some people who, teachers, um, surgeons, should have extra health care if they want it. And by the way, plenty of societies do that. If you want to be more educated and become a job like a teacher, like a surgeon, in places, a lot of Europe, for example, that's free. I mean, they give you that extra education benefit if you qualify for that level of education. If you are excelling in medicine, they pay for your, your extra education because that benefits everyone to have the best educated teachers, best edu educated surgeons. Does that benefit everyone? Yes. Now, let's try a radical one that I don't think we would agree to, but I just want to see how you are thinking. Would you vote for unequal incomes? Now, I don't think you really would. I think you would vote for basically equal incomes in society. Now notice, this doesn't mean that because we're voting on principles, principles include how much money you get, but we need to decide if our principles would produce directly unequal incomes. Sometimes they do, and usually this is when the Supreme Court jumps in and says that's unfair, that's unequal. But could we imagine a situation where some people would get more income? If you're imagining it, this is a completely reverse society that we have now. Who has tons of money now? Uh, people that own stocks, people that own banks, people that own stuff, people that trade stocks, right? Uh, the CEOs of major corporations. Well, let's think. Is that a society that we would create under the veil of ignorance? No. Their vast wealth doesn't create benefits for everyone, in fact, just the opposite. If you have great wealth in the society, probably you own a ton of real estate. Does that lead to benefits for everyone? No, just the opposite, right? We've seen how that works. But you might start imagining that, yes, maybe some people like janitors, maybe people in the military, maybe firefighters, right? Maybe they would get extra education. Sorry, sorry. Maybe they would get extra income. Now, I think it would be hard to agree to it, but this is what you're starting to think about because they benefit everyone. Do real estate magnets, do stock owners benefit everyone? Not at all, right? That's vast inequality and their jobs just promote even more inequality. But what if we're in a situation where there aren't enough janitors? What if there aren't enough people that want to be surgeons or have the risky jobs that we all depend on, like well, sanitation workers. I think in a society where you're thinking in a Rawlsian way, you would start to imagine if there's not enough, yeah, they should be compensated to encourage more people to do it. Now, I don't think we'd have to go this far in a fair society because I think there are people that would want these jobs because they see how helpful they are to other people. But remember, I think society, I think human nature is kind and good and unicorns and glitter and bouncy castles and I'm a ridiculous care bear sort of a thinker. Okay, I'm a weirdo. I think some of you love this, right? I think most of you find it really promising, but some of you love this idea, right? Oh, I think you're, I, I love Rawls, so I hope you did too. 